Have you ever heard of Missile Mail? It was supposed to be like Air Mail, but a lot faster. By missile, New York to Paris is just 20 minutes. On paper, the idea looks great. If delivering mail with daily exchanges of intercontinental ballistic missiles doesn't sound weird enough, the one time it was tried, it required not only the missile, but mail trucks, rail journeys, a submarine, and even a bicycle. Only the government could pull off something like that. Missile Mail was created by the U.S. Post Office Department in 1959 at the dawn of the Missile Age. The U.S. Postmaster General, Arthur E. Summerfield, saw great potential in postal service by missiles. He proclaimed this peacetime employment of a guided missile for the important and practical purpose of carrying mail is the first known official use of missiles by any post office department of any nation. To maximize the idea's impact, Summerfield had letters prepared to congressmen, senators, Supreme Court justices, governors, and senior defense officials. One was even prepared for the President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. At the time, the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile, the Polaris ICBM, wasn't yet tested. And since the Postal Service doesn't have its own missiles, there was only one option available, the U.S. Navy's SSM N-8 Regulus cruise missile. The U.S. Department of Defense approved the project, thinking it would be a good way to demonstrate to the Russians the precision targeting and reliability of the Regulus-1 cruise missile system. Due to the top-secret actual lack of reliability, a first trial flight was scheduled with a Navy cruise missile at Edwards Air Force Base on September 16, 1958. It failed miserably. A fire ensued, and all the mail was lost. The event was kept secret, however, and the Navy volunteered to try again with a missile launched from one of its submarines based from Norfolk, Virginia. A second top-secret attempt was scheduled for June 8, 1959. A bright red painted Regulus cruise missile was prepared for the flight, and the nuclear warhead was removed from the nose cone. As for the precision targeting and reliability claims, the Navy advised that, for the safety of the people of Norfolk, the submarine would have to sail out to sea before the launch. The Navy added some other bad news, too. The precision targeting of the Regulus cruise missile meant that it had a circular error of probability, or CEP, of 0.5% of its range. That meant that while it could presumably be aimed toward the runway at Anacostia Naval Air Station, just south of Washington, D.C., the missile would likely hit only within 2.5 nautical miles of its intended target. And that only 50% of the time. They could just as easily have hit the Capitol Building, the White House, the Pentagon, or the Washington Monument. As a better alternative, the Navy offered to fire the missile 600 miles south to the Mayport Naval Air Station near Jacksonville, Florida. Of course, the recipients of the letters were only a few hundred meters from Summerfield's office, but the letters would be taken 200 miles south first to Norfolk Navy Base, put on a submarine, and then fired off to Florida. When they got there, they would be delivered by rail and truck back up to Washington, D.C. It would be a round-trip journey of 1,400 miles. Then the Navy informed Summerfield that to ensure that the missile didn't stray too far off target, the submarine would first sail 500 miles south to Florida. Once close enough to ensure better accuracy, the missile would be fired across the last 100 miles and be guided into land at the Naval Air Station at Mayport. Even as the vision continued to stray from the original plan, Summerfield remained excited to see missile mail become reality. To comply with postal regulations, he made a special designation of USS Barbero as a temporary official government post office. Two special envelopes were prepared, both featuring illustrations of the Regulus cruise missile. Summerfield printed up 3,000 letters and had them stuffed into envelopes. Postage stamps were affixed to each. The letters were then trucked from Washington, on the road, 200 miles south to the post office in Norfolk, Virginia. They were dutifully postmarked with special stamps Summerfield had ordered to commemorate the first missile mail launch. The letters were then trucked to the Navy's submarine base, placed into two missile canisters, 
and loaded into USS Barbero. One of the canisters was painted blue and the other red as a salute to the new post office department blue and red logo that Summerfield himself had just recently introduced. The submarine skipper was Commander Robert H. Blount, who would later advance to the rank of Rear Admiral in the nuclear submarine fleet. Commander Blount took his boat to sea, keeping to the surface for greater speed. After two days of good weather sailing, the submarine arrived 100 miles off the Florida East Coast. To launch the cruise missile, the submarine had to be at full stop, dead in the water. The weather was clear and the waves were mild. The long and complicated process of preparing the Regulus cruise missile began in the pre-dawn hours of launch day. Meanwhile, the mail canisters were loaded into the missile's forward compartment underneath the nose cone. When dawn broke on June 8, 1959, the missile wasn't quite ready, so a four-hour delay was ordered. There was no need to rush with missile mail, after all. When everything was finally ready, the countdown began and the missile was fired at 1.41 p.m. After 22 minutes of flight time, it arrived at NAS Mayport in Florida and was close enough on target for Navy personnel to take control and guide it in to land directly on the runway. The missile was then towed off the ramp and the two small mail canisters were removed by Summerfield himself, who had flown down personally for the occasion. A postal mail carrier and a Navy admiral together removed the mail from the two mail canisters and placed it into an official mail bag. The bag was then put into the back of a postal station wagon and driven to the U.S. Post Office in Jacksonville. There, the letters were officially canceled. Summerfield caught a ride back to the airport and returned by plane to Washington, D.C. to wait for the mail to arrive. Of course, he could have just taken the 3,000 letters with him on the flight, but that was out of the question. The post office could handle it from there. Thus, the letters were loaded onto yet another truck and taken to the local rail yard in Jacksonville and placed into a special rail car which would travel north by railroad up to Alexandria, Virginia on the regularly scheduled postal train about a week later. After arriving, it would be offloaded, trucked to the local post office in Alexandria, and sorted along with the other mail coming in from Florida. Finally, the very special missile mail letters were trucked to the Union Station Post Office in Washington, D.C., and held while a message was sent to Summerfield and a special ceremony was scheduled with the President at the White House. All told, the first missile mail delivery had taken around two weeks to travel a round-trip journey of 1,400 miles, only 100 miles of which was actually on a missile. The journey had been by truck, submarine, missile, station wagon, rail, and truck again. Fittingly, the final leg of the trip to the White House was taken by bicycle. Overall, the operation was flawless, except, of course, for its obvious flaws. This was government work at its finest. At the White House, Summerfield attended along with the U.S. Post Office mail carrier for a very special delivery. While the photographers snapped photos, the mail carrier gladly handed President Eisenhower the first ever letter sent by missile mail. The four-cent stamp on the letter masked the true cost, however. Millions of dollars had been spent on that delivery. Of course, Summerfield declared the program a success. He said, Before man reaches the moon, mail will be delivered within hours from New York to California, to Britain, to India, or Australia by guided missiles. We stand on the threshold of rocket mail. After the speeches were over, however, very quietly, Summerfield shelved the project. And that was the end of Missile Mail. I'm Thomas Van Hare, and this is Historic Wings. Please subscribe, and remember, there's always more to the story.